Caucasus uh, the last Saturday of this much of this month, which I believe is March 26, and so we look forward to singing it between now and then, and likewise uh, a whole lot on that Saturday as we center uh, our attention upon that wonderful theme, faithful love, God's faithful love. This morning, I want you to open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, and while you open your Bibles to that passage, I want you to think about this. Oftentimes, you and I will purchase a product or be given something that comes with instructions. Now, whatever this product may be, whatever it is that we have purchased or has been given uh, can be good for us. Uh, we wouldn't have purchased it otherwise. It can be beneficial. It can serve a purpose, whether it's something for the house or something for the office or some kind of athletic equipment, uh, whatever it may be, something uh, involving our automobile, it is for our good. But the product comes with instructions. It comes with directions with regard to how to, to use this item properly. Now, I have been guilty before of thinking that I didn't have to read the instructions that it wasn't that important that I follow the guidelines. And I've always paid a price for that. It usually never works out if I just dismiss the instructions, refuse to follow the guidelines, and just choose to use this product any way I see fit. Usually it will not work properly. Usually I will tear it up. Something will happen because I did not follow the instructions. I want to tell you something. God has given us this gift called marriage, but you better follow the instructions. All right? If you don't follow the instructions, you're going to get in trouble. And many have. There are a lot of people today throughout our country and throughout the world who have taken hold of this gift called marriage, but seemingly have no desire to follow the guidelines, the instructions that come from the handbook which has been provided by the one who uh, produced, was the architect behind what we call marriage. And I'm, of course, speaking of God being the author of marriage, the one who has given us the Bible to be our guidebook uh, for marriage. In this book divine, we find all the instructions that are needed to provide for a happy, harmonious, healthy home. So we're growing families God's way. The only way to grow a home is God's way. And yet, the reason that we see so much divorce and so much cynicism surrounding the marriage relationship today is because either people willfully have set aside the instruction manual or ignorantly they have no real understanding of what's inside that manual. And as a result, marriages fail. Well, as a preacher, I want to do whatever I can to build up strong marriages. And surely as a congregation, you're committed to that as well. And those of you who are married, surely you want your marriage to be, to be strong and vibrant. And you want it to be exactly what God intended for it to be. Now that's why from time to time I preach sermons like I'm doing right now on the marriage relationship. Today we start with the wives. Why start with the wives? Well, that's just the polite thing to do, isn't it? Start with the ladies. And after all, when you study from the pen of the Apostle Peter or when you study from the pen of the Apostle Paul, they start with the wives. And I believe as this sermon unfolds, we will see why. Because when you consider who the woman is, she is key to the survival of this marvelous relationship. In fact, she... Uh, is the first one that's given instruction perhaps because of the nature of the woman. God created her a very, very, uh, in a very, very special way, and I believe she really is the key to the survival of the marriage. Now, the husband plays a part two. We're going to study him at a later time, all right? So, ladies, I tell you today, when I say something that's positive, don't start jabbing your husbands. When I say something you take negatively, don't say, well, when are you going to hit them? It's going to all balance out in the long run, okay? Just trust me with this. Now, in, in 1 Peter chapter 3, I want us to notice these first uh, six verses concerning not just the role of, of women, but more particularly the role of the wife. 
Peter says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. Now stop right there. He says, Be in subjection to your own husbands. All right? He's talking about the husband wife relationship. The wife is not necessarily in subjection to any other man, she's in subjection to her own husband. Be in subjection to your own husbands that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation or the manner of life of the wives. He's speaking to wives who very well could be married to a non-Christian. And then he says, let them behold your chaste conversation, your chaste way of living, coupled with fear, coupled with the respect that you have for God and for Him. Whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection to their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord whose daughters you are as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Now, Abraham and Sarah are mentioned here as a couple that ought to be followed. But wait a minute. If ever there was a couple who had a good excuse to get a divorce, it was Abraham and Sarah. Here is a, a couple that survived through the midst of a lot of marital difficulties, including another woman, being involved in that relationship. Not only that, theirs was a very disruptive relationship, always moving to different places. And I want to tell you, that is most difficult on a woman. Now, a man will find a job somewhere across the country or maybe some other part of the world, and he says, i got to go take it. But it's very difficult for that woman to, to uproot. She's secure in that which is familiar. And yet Sarah was always on the go with Abraham. Likewise, they had problems with their children. Was that the only couple in history that ever had any problems with their children? No. Not only that, here is a couple that at times the two of them were careless with the truth. They didn't always tell the truth and that caused difficulties. But we also see a couple who made it through the various uh, stages of life. They grew old together. Despite all the difficulties, despite the fact that if they lived in modern day America, they could have just said, hey, we give up, we're getting a divorce. They didn't. Why? Because of a principle that was already old, even at the time that Abraham and Sarah were married, and it's called commitment. They were totally committed to one another. We've got this idea in our society today that it's love that keeps a relationship together. Not at all. It's commitment that keeps a relationship together. You see, commitment is what keeps the love there. Husbands, love your wives. That's not an option. It's a command. It's a command. And so this couple, uh, Abraham and Sarah, were committed to one another, and they had learned some principles from early in their marriage that lasted an entire lifetime. And those principles were rooted in, in commitment. Now, I have found this to be true, true. People who get divorced and those who do not generally have the same problems. Did you know that? The people who get divorced and the people who don't get divorced generally have the same problems. Now, I understand that there are some who get divorced and one in that uh, union was committed to the survival of the marriage and yet the other person in that marriage was not and therefore the other was going to get a divorce no matter what even when the mate another mate tried the other mate tried to save the marriage and to secure the marriage but you know as well as I do that there are some couples who are committed to solving marital difficulties and others who are not now, Celicia and I have commented on this before. When we've had some kind of disagreement and we're solving something in our marriage, she and I will reflect later and say, you know, that's the kind of problem that if we don't settle it God's way, that leads other couples to get a divorce. And it's absolutely true. Either we're going to settle this God's way and say I'm sorry and learn to forgive 
and stay committed or else we just do like the rest of the world and just call it quits on our marriage. I want to tell you something. We said early in life, uh, early in our married life, even before we got married, we're going to take that word divorce out of our vocabulary. We didn't want that. Now that takes two people to be committed to that. And she and I have been committed to that. Not a problem-free marriage. We are not one of those couples who were just made for each other. You ever hear that? When two couples, when, when, when two people in a relationship, a couple seems to get along, and people want to say, oh, you were just made for one another. No. But some couples have decided to be committed to God's principles for marriage. And that overrides everything else. And when we're committed to the principles and we know the instructions that God has given, marriage can indeed survive. And so, I've said this before, you've heard me say it, if Celicia ever leaves me, I'm going with her, right? Yeah, I'm going with her. That's how committed I am to her, and I know she's committed to me. She may feel like at times living with me, she needs to be committed somewhere, but she's committed to me. Now, let's notice from this particular account in 1 Peter 3 something that will help wives. The title of the message, A Word for the Wives. Here's some things I want you to notice this morning. Notice her submission. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. Another word for subjection is submission. Now, that's an idea that is mocked today in society. And primarily it's mocked for, for, for two reasons, I think. One is that there are those out in our society who are part of the feminist movement who were born women and they despise that fact. And therefore, because they weren't born men, they hate all men. That's it. And so, therefore, they... they despise language contained in God's Word like this where an inspired apostle says, Wives, be in subjection or be submissive to your own husbands. Now, there are others who just simply don't understand what that means. To some who are good, faithful Christian women, they may have the idea that, that this language means that the wife is, is second rate to the husband, and it doesn't mean that at all. I spoke on marriage and family at at a gospel meeting over in Middle Tennessee last summer. And I'll never forget a, a wife, mother, faithful member of that church came to me and she said, well, that was a good sermon on marriage, but I'll tell you one thing, I'll never be submissive to him. <laughs> and she smiled when she said it, and I smiled when I said, but you've got to be. She said, nope. She said, that will not work. He does not expect me to be that way. I'm not submitting to him. And he doesn't expect me to submit to him. And I said, well, if you understand what the Bible teaches about submission, you must in order to be a faithful wife. Now, I'm convinced she just did not understand what was meant by submitting oneself to her husband. She had the idea that by submitting to him, he is some kind of dictator. He's some kind of boss. But that's not how the Bible presents a godly husband. What we need to understand about God is this. He is a God of order, isn't he? Whatever God does, God does in an orderly fashion. And so without submission in the home, there is no order. There is no order. Now here's something we have to understand. At some point in our lives, at, at different stages in our lives, we're going to always be under somebody. We're going to always be in submissive, submission to somebody. Children are to be submissive to their parents. A teenage boy can't say, well, daddy's leaving home and the Bible says man's to be the head of the home and so mama, you're going to have to do what I say this week. No, it doesn't work that way. Mama's in charge now, right? No, she's second in command, not a teenage boy who just thinks he's a man. No, that's not how it works. Children are being submission to their parents. Wives in submission to their husbands. Employees in submission to their employers. We are to be in submission to civil government. In the church, the church is to be submissive to its head, Jesus Christ, and to the local congregation's leaders, the elders or shepherds or bishops or, or pastors as the Bible identifies them, a plurality of men who oversee a congregation. And understand this, no matter who we may be, 
we will always have the obligation to be in submission to Almighty God. So no matter at what point in life we find ourselves, we're going to be in submission to someone. If no one else, we're in submission to God or we're supposed to be. But this idea is mocked because people do not understand the importance of order in the home. But God is a God of order. To the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 14, Paul is explaining about spiritual gifts. But the very last verse of that chapter says, Let all things be done decently and in order. God expects us to follow His divine order. Now here's what needs to be understood. Just because someone is submissive to another does not mean that the one in submission is inferior in any way. In no way is the wife inferior to her husband. She in no way is second rate to him. I want you to consider with me just for a moment 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and notice what verse 3 of that chapter says about the Lord Jesus Christ. And then I want to ask you a question. Now, this is the Apostle Paul speaking. He said, I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. That's submission, isn't it? The head of every man is Christ. And the head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. In this particular instance, it is speaking of Christ the Son in submission to God the Father. Now let me ask you this. Because while Christ Jesus was here on earth, he submitted himself to the will of the Father, did that make him inferior to the Father? No. Colossians 2.9 Christ Jesus, in him dwells all the Godhead bodily. When Paul said, I'm not one whit behind the very chiefest of the apostles, Jesus Christ is not one whit behind the other two members of the divine Godhead. But Philippians 2, 5 says Jesus submitted himself, didn't he? He humbled himself. Why? Out of respect for God's order. Remember Galatians 3, 28 in Christ, there's neither male nor female. When Jesus Christ came to die on the cross for our sins, didn't he die for men and women, for boys and girls? Yes, he did. But just because we are equal does not mean we have the same role. Equal in value, but we do not have the same role. And don't ever forget this, God made us different that he might make us one. And when a woman accepts this, I won't tell you what's going to happen, it will get her husband's attention. Look at verse 2 of our text, 2 Peter 3, 2. While they, listen to this word, behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Behold, the man is, is looking upon something, something that's very beautiful, something that's hard to comprehend. Here is a man that Peter says is not even a Christian. And yet he sees this wife who, because of her love for her Lord and respect of her, for her husband, she submits to him and it gets his attention. Friends, I particularly want our ladies to see something. It's a secret perhaps. You'll never be more like Jesus till you understand what it means to be in submission. I believe that God who ordered, who ordered the things of this earth in a certain particular way ordered the home the way he did because, number one, for the home to survive and to prosper, there had to be headship. And he said headship is with the husband. And the wife is to submit because God created her a certain way. Her nature is such that of the two, she can more easily submit herself. In fact, when a woman refuses to do this, I believe she sins against her nature. I believe she sins against the way that God created her. Now, let's illustrate it this way so we can understand what Peter is talking about in this passage, what Paul is talking about in Ephesians 5. Besides, this illustration gives me opportunity to talk about Alabama. Okay, just give me a moment here. Alabama's had a few good football seasons in recent years. This past year, Alabama had a running back that won the Heisman Trophy by the name of Derrick Henry. Derrick Henry, when he started out, I mean, there was a high bar already set. And yet, 
Derrick Henry broke all kinds of records at the University of Alabama. Derrick Henry, next month, when the NFL draft takes place, he will go high in the draft, and just like this, he's going to become a millionaire because he is a super talented running back. But they're also on that team, like other football teams, was a man who's in another position. He's called the quarterback. Jake Coker was our quarterback. Jake Coker is a talented football player. He wouldn't be quarterbacking for a college program if he wasn't talented. But most likely, when Jake gets his degree, he's going to have to go get an MBA or something like that because he's not going on to the college level. It's doubtful. Or to the pro, professional level. It's doubtful. It's not going to happen. You see, of the two, which one's the most talented? It's that running back. He's more talented athletically than the quarterback. You see, very few who play college football, and I, I mean that's something to play college football, but very few who play college football are able to take it to the, to the next level, the NFL. Derrick Henry will go to the NFL, but not Jake Coker. Yet on that football team, Derrick Henry had to submit himself to Jake Coker. You say, what do you mean? Because Jake Coker is the quarterback, and the running back follows the lead of the quarterback. Who said that? Coach Saban on the sideline says the quarterback calls the plays. So what if Derrick Henry just decides, well, I'm not going to pay attention to that. I'll do my own thing. I'll steal the ball away from the other running back. I'll run the route that I want to take. I'm not going to pay any attention to him. Here's what would happen. It would have crushed Alabama. Derrick Henry would have never been the Heisman Trophy winner. There would have been no national championship. There would be no drafting of Derrick Henry next month in the NFL draft if he'd done that. Why? That's disorderly. Uh, you see, if you want to go far in life, you've got to understand the principle of submission. And if we want to understand that in the home, then the wife must understand she is to be in submission to her own husband for the Lord's sake, for order's sake. Now, a word to the wives. That's the title of the sermon. Notice here the woman's submission. Notice something else. Notice her speech. Notice her speech. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. The conversation there, her manner of living. While they behold your chaste conversation or manner of living, coupled with fear, coupled with respect that she has for God and his divine plan and for her and for her husband. Now, does the wife speak? Sure she speaks. One husband said to his wife, he said, I read in a study not long ago that women speak twice as much as men. We use about 10,000 words every day and women use about 20,000 words every day. And she thought about that just a second and she said, well, the reason that we use 20,000 words every day is because we have to repeat everything to you men. He said, what? <laughs> now, a lot of ladies know what I'm talking about, right? You can say amen to that. Very, very true. Oftentimes, our wives say we get tired of having to repeat ourselves. But a woman indeed does speak. But notice what verses 1 and 2 make clear. She does not nag him. She doesn't do that. I want to tell you something. Ladies, here's another secret. I'll let you in about me. You will never, ever be able to accomplish anything nagging your husband. I've been after him for six months, and it'll be six more months if you keep on approaching it like that. He will not do this. I've stayed on him. Well, you just... Keep on staying on him about it because it's not going to work that way. You see, here is a man that is not a Christian, 1 Peter chapter 3. And Peter says, you're not going to nag him into becoming a Christian. It will not be that that brings him to Christ. No, it's going to be something else, but it will not be nagging him. 
Listen to what the wise man wrote about the nagging wife. Look at Proverbs chapter 19. And, and I didn't make this up. The, the, these passages are, are in here. Notice in Proverbs chapter 19, verse 13, a foolish son is the calamity of his father, and that's so true. And the contentions of a wife are a continual dropping, or according to the New American Standard Bible, a constant dripping. If you're trying to go to sleep at night, it's quiet as it can be, but all of a sudden you hear a dripping faucet. Drip, 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 drip. Can you sleep? No. You've got to do something about that. And, and the wise man says that's exactly what it's like living in a house with constant nagging. Drip, drip. Drip. Look at Proverbs chapter 21, just across the page in my Bible in verse 9. It is better to dwell in a corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. <laughs> Who is this kind of woman? A contentious woman. The wise man says it, it's rather just have your own little corner of a house than to live in a palatial mansion with this kind of woman. So, Peter says, look at this woman under consideration. And he says, this is not the kind of woman who is nagging her husband. You see, he, she will not have a positive influence upon him if that's what she seeks to do. But here is a man who hears more than just words. He sees her purity. And he sees the respect that she has for him. He lives with a sermon. He eats with a sermon. He uh, sleeps with a sermon every day. And over a period of time, he comes to Christ Jesus through the influence of this companion, this helpmeet, the woman who is his wife. A wife says, well, I tried all that and it didn't work. Well, you're going to have to keep on trying because that's what God says you're supposed to do. We're talking about God's woman, the wife that he says needs to be found in the home. Notice this woman's submission. Notice her speech, but then notice something else about her, her serenity. Look at verses 3 and 4 of 1 Peter 3. Hers whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or putting on of apparel. Now, this is has this is caused some in the religious world to take this to an extreme. Uh, some who will never put makeup on, never allow the hair to be cut and things of that nature. Don't take this to an extreme because the text also says something about uh, not the putting on of apparel. Does that mean a woman shouldn't wear clothes? <laughs> well, the very idea. Of course not. You see, uh, these cosmetics that women have, and I tell you, there's a lot of money made because of cosmetics. And I'm all for it. Aren't you men for these cosmetics? Yes. We're for it. But let cosmetics enhance inner qualities. Let the, let the, the face and the appearance uh, of a woman enhance the inner qualities that Peter says are of much more valuable. Now, Peter says you think about this woman Abraham, uh, rather Sarah. Did you know that Sarah was a very, very beautiful woman? Genesis 12 uh, speaks of Abraham and Sarah going down into Egypt. And uh, the text says in the King James, she was a fair woman, fair to look upon. That is, she was a very beautiful woman. Now, we shouldn't be surprised that Pharaoh had top aides who were always looking out for beautiful women to bring to the Pharaoh. You want to get in good with the Pharaoh? Bring some beautiful women to him. I'm telling you, friends, the lust of the flesh didn't start in the 21st century, did it? No, no. Pharaoh would appreciate any beautiful women brought his way. And so Sarah was noticed, and she was brought to the Pharaoh. And you see, Abraham lied about her. He said, I know they're going to be after you, and they might even kill me. So just tell them you're my sister, which she was his half-sister, but also his wife. And God plagued Pharaoh with dreams 
till he came to a realization, wait a minute, this woman does belong to somebody else. At least you got to give credit to Pharaoh for that. This woman does not have the right to be mine. She belongs to another man. And uh, the Pharaoh was, was very upset with Abraham and said, you know, you've tried to deceive me and what are you trying to bring upon me and my household? You didn't tell me this was your wife. The point is Sarah was very, very beautiful woman. But her beauty, her beauty was deeper than that which you find in her outward appearance. And so Peter writes the same thing here. There is something very beautiful about this woman he's describing because she has a meek and quiet spirit. A meek and quiet spirit. In the sight of God, that's of great value. And young ladies, you'd be surprised how many young men consider that still of great value. You see, young ladies, don't ever sacrifice your purity on the altar of an old boy's lust. Don't do that. These old boys will tell you all kinds of things to get you to do that which you shouldn't do to satisfy their lust. I sometimes describe it this way. When I was a boy, if I ate an orange, here's how I would eat an orange. I would cut the, uh, a, a hole in the top of that orange, and then I would take that orange and I would suck all the juice out of it. I mean, just as much of that juice I could get out of there, and then I'd throw it in the trash can and say how much I love oranges, right? That's exactly what some of these boys will do to you young ladies. Tell you how much you're loved. And if you love them in return, here's what you will do. Even though you know what you're doing is immoral and ungodly, you just love hearing all of that. But here's what's going to happen. As soon as you give in to that temptation, you're just going to be tossed over the shoulder and the old boy's going to say, my, how I love oranges, right? And move on to the next one that he can corrupt. When you give in to that, let me tell you, when those fellows start looking for a wife, it will not be those whom they have corrupted. It won't be. You see, Peter says there's something much more than outward appearance that's important. He says it's the beauty of that which is within, the meek and the quiet spirit, one who is pure, who loves God and at the same time will love her husband. Peter says that's, that's the kind of wife that's pleasing to God and helps create strong strong families. So we notice her submission. We notice her speech. We notice her serenity. One more point I want to give you today from this particular passage, and that is her service. Back to Sarah. Verse 6 says, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. That just means she respected Abraham. That's all that means. Now, I don't know very few women today that go around calling their husbands Lord, but I know godly Christian women who do respect their husbands. She respected Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are. Those of you who emulate what Peter is teaching here are the daughters of Sarah, whose daughters ye are as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. That is, uh, you don't do this because you feel inferior. You, you don't do this because you're coerced into it. You do this because you love the Lord and you love your husbands and you love your family. And you want to be a godly Christian woman. Here is a woman that Peter identifies as one who respects her husband. And he respects her in return. At least he should respect her. You see, here is a woman who, who helps him. She was taken from his side in the very beginning of time. Not from his head for her to rule over him. Not from his feet for him to walk all over her. But rather from his side. To be his companion. That's what help meet means. I will make a help meet for him is what God said. One that is a suitable companion. One that can be his helper. One who can complete him. And so like sandpaper, uh, the wife is able to mold and shape all those rough edges of the man. And there are many. She completes him and she compliments him. And so Proverbs 31, 12 comes to mind as I study this passage. Speaking of the virtuous woman, she will do him good and not evil all the days of his life. 
I'm thankful to have someone by my side who will always do me good. Brother Ted, you had that, didn't you? Yes. Sister Sherry, a faithful companion, and I have been blessed to know many others down through the years who have given exemplary examples of what it means to be God's woman in the home. She will do him good and not evil all the days of his life. I want to tell you, something's wrong when a boy uh, or a girl, uh, children are, are looking through a photograph album, giggling at mom and daddy's wedding pictures, and a little boy looks at that picture of mom and he says, Daddy, is that when mama came to work for us? <laughs> oh, you better watch out. And Daddy better do a better job of explaining just who she is. She is the queen of that household. She's not, she's not intimidated into that role. She loves it because she loves her God and she loves her husband. I think I can understand more what that little boy said when he told somebody about his mother being in the hospital. He said, yes, he said, mom's in the hospital. Been there all week. And he said, now daddy and myself and my brothers Jimmy and Tommy and my sister Susie and Cindy and the dog uh, Spot and uh, our, our cat, we're all home alone, right? <laughs> No, you're not home alone. You got daddy and you got brothers and you got sisters and you got the dog and you got the cat. No, if mom's not there, we're all alone because she indeed is the queen of that household. God does things right. And God created the family for our good. I mean, it really is the centerpiece of life, isn't it? And when a family member is taken from us, you can't, you can't grieve any more than when you find yourself in that situation because the dearest on earth is taken from us when a family member is taken from us. And God intended for us to be close like that. He intended for the home to be a foretaste of heaven above. And I'll tell you, there are many, many reasons why I want to go to heaven. But I'll tell you one reason. I want to go to be with my loved ones from my family one day. And I'll tell you, I'll do everything that I can, and I know my wife will as well, to make sure our family gets to heaven. Are you committed to that as well? A word to the wives today. Some help for husbands next week. But a word to the wives today. Let's all of us unite upon God's word, the God who is the author of marriage, family, and the home. Best way to have a good home, best way to have a great home is for everybody who's a responsible age in that home to be a Christian. And so you may be here today a husband or a, a wife or a mother or a father or a child who's reached the responsible age of maturity, knowing right from wrong and knowing what you need to do to become a Christian, and yet you're still holding out. I want to tell you, this morning, you commit yourself not only to your home, commit yourself to Christ. And when you commit yourself to Christ, your home will be the better for it. Your entire life will change for the better. If you will commit yourself to Christ and following His principles, and one outside of Jesus becomes a Christian by obeying the gospel. That means a penitent believer confesses Jesus as the Son of God and is baptized for the remission of sins. Have you done that? If you haven't, you need to do that today and become part of God's family. And maybe you need to be restored to God's spiritual family because if you are, if you are not faithful to God's spiritual family, it's likely you're also not really faithful in your family here on earth. Something's missing. You're not what you ought to be in your home if you're unfaithful to your Lord. Make that right even today as together we stand and sing.